can't have some i think the live chat is disabled then but yeah um so this looks great so i think what we is i, I, I muted myself for yeah, just to be yeah, sure. yeah. We should we should all be <laughs> muted. And um, so, what would be great is if everyone would just watch the YouTube chat. I will do as well, and we will relay questions to Cornel. Mm -hmm. And we already have nine people watching, roughly. So I think we can can start. Um, so hi, folks. Um, we are back. It's a month already. With us are. A few more people than usual. So beside myself, we have the incredible Cornel who is giving this amazing talk today. And also taking the time are uh, Ivan and Gopal. Uh, we will be the panel to relay questions for you and we'll interact with Cornel as well. And I will post a link to a survey uh, the incredible Cornel already created for us. And if you could have a quick look there and give a vote, because this will have an impact on the later presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I will just shut up and give the stage over to uh, Cornel. Have fun. Thank you very much, Holger. Um, I didn't know I was that incredible. <laughs> um, Welcome to the audience. Uh, I'm sitting in South Africa and in, uh, unlike most of you, it's I'm experiencing cold temperatures. Everybody else seems to be suffering, but that's the state of the planet. It's a big seesaw that's getting bigger. Um, <clears throat> but the topic for tonight is finite state machines. And I have developed a Kotlin DSL for managing finite state machines. So let me start this whole process. A little bit about myself. Um, I've always uh, applied my mind to try and understand the world. And um, uh, these are two of my favorite quotes. Um, the first one, you may not know this gentleman, Graham Mitchell, but he was um, the first senior uh, technical person that I worked under. And um, it was about two weeks and he told me, uh, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. And um, I, I, I learned something from that. And there's a variation that comes from Mr. Einstein, who should say, who said everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. So why these quotes? Well, I think uh, that for me, that's the heart of software development. If you don't keep this in mind, things get messy. And um, how does this apply to state machines? Well, what is a state machine? Here's a little example of a thing called the useless box, but it is in fact a little state machine. And we will get to some of the details later. You may have seen this video. And there's some variations on this thing. So what is a state machine? Here's a much more complex example. Uh, the very first state machine that I implemented was uh, to implement a packet reader. And um, there was a Reuters feed on a serial line. And if you ever wrote code for uh, serial communication, some of this might seem familiar. And, uh, but I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this. Uh, here is a different state machine, and it's one that I've implemented nearly 10 years ago, and it's I'm still working on this project over time. It is used in um, insurance and uh, we, to, to, to manage the process of generating a quotation and um, calculating a, um, an annuity and then producing documentation and taking it through a life cycle, etc. So um, this is a real one that is in use, but these are all very complex. So 
let's start at the beginning. So what is state machines? There's uh, uh, different terms in use, uh, finite state machines or finite state automa. Uh, there's non-deterministic state machines and non-deterministic state automa. Uh, there are state tables and state charts and state maps. And then there are the distinction between Mealy and Moore machines, which is uh, the one has a state plus input and the other one just has state, which means that there's a difference between um, the event and the state. And um, for me, it's obvious that um, uh, events are distinct from states. And the very first example that I'll show you and with that we'll dive into, goes into that distinction. A lot of these were formalized with uh, UML specification on state machines, but the UML has sort of slowed down. Uh, there hasn't been much activity or some anything new for some time. But then there is a specification SDL that is big in the telecoms world and the embedded world that um, uh, we're similar, but they're also um, uh, diverging, but the SDL is alive and well, and it has a specification for state machines. So all of these talk about state machines, and there's a Wikipedia page that um, will take you to various um, resources. Now, they are usually expressed in a diagram, and here is a simple diagram that identifies some of the elements. So here we have our start state, and then we have blocks that depict state, and we have a potential end state. A lot of state diagrams never have an end state. We have um, events that can trigger transitions. So, these arrows, like you see, there's an arrow, which means that an event that happens while the machine is in state one can cause a transition to state two. And here is one that actually remains within state two. You see the term guard expression. So what that typically is, is an expression that is applied to determine whether that event is allowed. Now that implies that you either look at the, uh, the context or you look at the event itself. And I'll show you what mechanisms we have for that. And then we have an action or multiple actions. So that means as a part of this transition, these actions are performed. So this is where the work gets done. So this thing becomes a mechanism for having tight control on when these actions take place. And it is a way of depicting it and of reasoning about it. If you go read up on state machines, you may come across this example. Now, you might wonder what, okay, we know what a turnstile is when we get to an office block with security or to a train station, there might be a turnstile. And, um, but what does it have to do with coins? Well, if you're old enough, you might have used one or you might have seen one in a movie where people, um, before they had uh, card-based systems, you just had a flat rate you would put in a, 20 or a 50 cent coin in the US and that gets you through the turnstile and onto the train. And the coin then unlocks. So the turnstile is locked, which means you can't move the, um, the turnstile arms and the coin unlocks it. And then it's in unlocked state. And if you then push the arm, you're passing the, through the turnstile that locks it again. But if it's unlocked and you put in another coin, hopefully it returns the coin. And if it is locked and you push on the arm, it may make a buzzing sound, which is the 
alarm action. So now we have two states and we have two events, but we have different parts because in some cases we stay where we are and in other cases we change state. So this is a very simple um, state machine and I use it in a few examples. And um, that's the one that I will be building later. And um, I would like to ask you guys to vote for which technology um, you would want to see the demonstration in. Now, um, if you live in a country like South Africa, you might understand what the double lock, lock is. We all have security doors that you have to lock the, turn the key twice um, to lock it and you have to turn the key twice to unlock it. So when it's lo double locked, a first turn of the key doesn't unlock it. So it goes back to that state and then the unlock takes it to unlock state. So this is an example of how that state machine would look if you implement it um, electronically. In most of those cases, those locks are just mechanical, but this is an example of such a machine. Now, if we go back to the turnstile and we add the notion of a card, if you get to your um, office block um, sometime in the future, you might have a card that allows you entry into the system. So that turnstile is locked and you present a card. And over here, it determines that your card is valid or that the, an override is allowed but it then unlocks you. If the card is presented and it's the supervisor that will enable the override, which can allow anybody to pass because sometimes you get there and um, uh, the card is locked for some reason and the supervisor decides to let you through, this mechanism will allow you. If the system says the card is invalid, it generates an invalid card message, but it stays in locked state. If you try to pass while it's in locked state, there's a little buzzer. If it's unlocked and the supervisor wants to lock it again, they can present their card and that will change it to the locked state. And if it's unlocked, and you push the arm, it goes back to locked state. So here you can see an example of where, what this guard expression is used for. So it can make a determination of which transition to follow based on um, an expression that is evaluated on, in this case, an identifier that is passed in. So this state machine, the card event, actually takes an identifier that identifies uh, the card. And that gives the state machine a lot more meaning. Now, how do we unpack the state machine? We want to start representing it in a way that we can um, look at it that's more than a diagram um, but is still useful so here's an example of a state table that has a column for state and a column for event a column for the end state and a column for the actions so the locked state uh, groups the two events so if it's locked and you get the coin event and it goes to unlocked state and applies the unlock action. If it's locked and you get the pass event, you get the alarm action and there's no next state that remains in the locked state. If it's unlocked and you get the coin event, it returns the coin and it remains in that state. 
if you get the pass event, it goes to locked and it applies the lock action. So this is now a different way of representing it. And if you would want to implement code, um, you would want to try and depict something like this that another human can read and understand. Now, when I first um, used the state machine, I had read about um, different um, patterns for implementing it. And um, in fact, that was even before the term pattern was, was commonplace. But I generated co um, code from rational rows um, to generate a, a state machine implementation. And um, a few years later, I saw a project called SMC, which is a state map compiler, which has a markup language for describing your uh, state machine. That's not unlike uh, the state table I just showed you. And these usually use a class per state and a method uh, per event. So there's typically an interface that represents the state machine with methods for each of the events, and then an instance of that for each of the states. And if you call the event on that state, then it performs the relevant actions. And um, that project, the initial project of the SMC generated it like that. And, um, but that project sort of died, it didn't um, grow. And somebody started a new SMC project based on that code. And um, it generates code for a host of different languages. And that project is, um, is still alive. You can find it on SourceForge. And the reason I implemented my DSL is because I went there and I saw they don't generate Kotlin. And I said, OK. Well, uh, Kotlin DSL might allow me to describe a state machine um, without going through this process of actually generating code. And the other thing I saw is that the latest uh, incarnations of SMC generates a huge um, switch statement, which is actually pretty ugly. So the code it generates is, is um, um, difficult to read. You have to go back to the model to, um, uh, uh, to understand it. Um, then there's this very scary thing uh, called SCXML, which is an uh, executable XML state chart. Um, I had bad dreams for a few nights after seeing this. Um, there's another thing, part of the Spring project, there's a state machine implementation that's pretty interesting because it can be distributed. And um, it uses, uh, let's say, a language builder. So you define the state machine um, in code, in configuration, and with annotations and stuff like that. So, um, Oh yes, here is the nightmare. So this is typically what the markup looks like for SCXML. And here's actually a very simple example of the Stern style state machine. So it is possible, but this thing itself won't really do anything because to make SCXML work, you have to add a lot of other stuff. And then you can hardly see the, um, the actual state machine that you wanted to, to implement. This is what the SMC markup looked like. So you would define a state and you had curly braces and you had events and then your next state and your actions. And then you can see um, this fits languages like uh, C and C++ and Java um, and C sharp very well. So they don't have to do much. They can just take those blocks and use them. And um, um, I decided that a lot of this is, is useful. 
So um, let's quickly run through the features that I um, implemented before I show you what it looks like. So uh, the KFSM project implements uh, support for obviously states and transition transitions on events. So uh, you provide it with a set of states and a set of events. Usually I use an, an enum to represent that, but it doesn't have to be an enum. It can be anything that's um, comparable. Um, I provide for guard expressions. I provide for entry and exit actions. So that means that you can have an action that gets triggered as you enter a state and an action that gets triggered as you exit a state. And if that action throws an exception, obviously it'll prevent that uh, from continuing. I provide for a typed event parameter and for a typed return value, which is useful if you want to have a um, uh, uh, immutable um, uh, state machine. And I provide for automatic transitions. So what are those? An automatic transition is something that happens automatically when you enter a certain state. So uh, that would be useful that there's a common state that you go to. And if you go there, then something happens. So you don't always have to specify um, a certain set of actions with a certain transition. You can just transition to a state. And when you get to that state, um, there's an automatic transition that takes place. And usually that then takes you somewhere else. But you can now, if you combine that with guard expressions, you can see that it's powerful that if you go to a certain state, you can have decision making that then decides based on the guard expression to take you somewhere else. But the sender doesn't know um, uh, uh, the details. So uh, you can separate some of the complexity. I provide for timeouts. So that means that um, when you enter a state, the timer starts. And if that timeout is reached, um, it will then trigger a um, transition and actions. Now, uh, that timer is then usually stopped when you leave the, um, the state, because obviously you don't want um, uh, uh, um, it to pull you back. I provide for named state maps. So in essence, the state machine is a state map that can contain other state maps. So the top level one is the default state map and you don't have to name it explicitly. But what that does allow you to do is to do a push transition that saves your current state on a stack and then goes to a named state map. And in the named state map, you can now have transitions. And when you want, you can just say pop. And the pop will go back to the state that it was before you entered this um, state map. Now, if you look at this um, coin example, say you want the, um, the collection of coins so because people might have to put in multiple coins to take place um, separately. And um, any coin event goes to the coin map. And the coin map will then um, have a guard expression that says, if I have um, enough money, then I can unlock. And if I have more money than I need to, then I can dispense change. And um, all of that happens within um, a separate um, state map. Um, so the push gets you into the state map and the pop gets you out. And you can have an automatic pop with a guard expression, for example. Or you could have a timeout that, that pops you out. Um, the implementation is multi-platform, so it's pure Kotlin, and you can run it anywhere 
um, I, I, I'm, I, I've done builds for the JVM and for JS and um, um, Native. Um, and anybody who's interested in taking it anywhere else or wanting to add a platform, let me know. There's no third party dependencies. And I've built a visualization plugin that can actually take your um, state map or your definition and generate a um, plant UML diagram. And it can generate a um, ASCII doc uh, representation that uh, looks like that is your um, uh, state map. So um, what does it look like? So here's an example of a state machine definition. So this is the one that we were looking at. And as you can see, I have a, an enum and I take all the values and I create a set of that. So um, initially I decided to just have the enum class and I tell it about the class and it would then say, oh, okay, I'll take all the enumerations as my possible states. But um, then I realized that there might be a case where you do have um, some states that don't necessarily apply to the top level map. They only apply to one of the other named maps. So that's why I decided to allow for um, you to basically define a set of um, uh, things that I compare. And the same applies to events. And then you define the context. So the context is the thing that we're operating on. Now, this specific example is one that's immutable. So that is why it's the event parameter and it's also the event return type. And that's what all of these, these classes define. So the first one is the context, then uh, the event parameter class, and then the event return class. In this case, they're all three the same because what I'm doing in this case, and I did this as an example to show um, people who are interested in a pure functional approach that you can still use the state machine, but you basically create the state machine on every event. Uh, you have a definition and you just wrap uh, the context with the definition. It derives the current state using this initial state expression. And then, um, the rest of it defines what we want to do. So in this case, we, our actions are basically manipulating um, this context and also returning it. So we're using a copy to change the lock state and a message that's part of the context. So in the case of return coin, we can set the message to return coin and um, return that. So if you want a more traditional approach, then um, you may only just have a context or you, you might just have a context and uh, event type and not a return type. But I do allow for return types, as I say. And that return type is optional and that's why I use this require here to force it to to check that it, if I need it, that it is there. And then obviously the, because of require, um, after that the compiler says, well, info is not null, so you don't have to um, say info question dot copy, you can info is, um, uh, it, know, it knows it's not null. So that's a useful uh, mechanism there. Um, this is what the generated um, ASCII doc looks like for um, uh, that example that I just showed you. So the visualization plugin will generate this um, ASCII doc um, 
uh, for you. And this is what a state diagram for the same thing looks like. So let's go back to that useless box we saw. So what does that state machine look like? Well, there's only one event and it's called switch because you saw that um, the person with it um, flipping the switch with their finger. And what happens is when they hit the switch, it opens the lid. And when the lid is opened, then there's an automatic thing that comes out and flips the switch and that closes the lid again. So this is an example of how that state machine will uh, look like. And if you take that thing and you apply AI and assistive technology to improve the user experience, then you end up with this kind of mess. And uh, we may have seen that in real life. So how do we build this thing? So things we need to consider, you might have heard I spoke of a context. So the context is the thing that we operate on. That's the class we're going to apply the actions to. And I usually define that as an interface, but it doesn't have to be. It can be a, a concrete class. I have states, and I usually use an, an enum for the states, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it can just be an object with a set of constant values or whatever you want. Um, and we have an event type, and for that, for that I also usually use an enum, but as I say, it can be um, uh, some anything that's comparable. So um, you could have strings or, or, or anything to depict those names. And the state machine itself literally has these operations. You can send it an event, so you give it the event type and then a parameter. But and that's something that um, um, I find useful is you can ask it what events are allowed given, sorry, given the current state. That's useful because you can use that to turn front end components on and off without having to add logic to say, well, if I'm in this state, then this thing is allowed. The state machine knows what's allowed and you only ask it, give me the list of events that's allowed. And um, I use it like that often. If I need to get the full list up front, then I can ask it questions to the definition that says, what are the possible events given a specific state? So I can ask it, make that call for all the states and I can get all those combinations. And um, obviously, um, this does not uh, take the um, guard expressions into consideration because um, we don't have that information yet. So um, um, uh, those would um, just complicate this whole thing. But at least what this does is it says, well, I'm allowed to try this um, uh, this event because there's a chance that that event may succeed or not, or, or not. And I would know about the outcome because of um, uh, the system telling me. So it might throw an exception in some case or um, uh, um, it might go somewhere else. In the case of guard expressions, you will typically find that it falls through and if it doesn't match, um, then you are gonna get an exception that says um, this event was, um, um, was not allowed and that's the reason. Um, I actually have a state machine builder where you create transitions and entry definitions and exit definitions. 
and you can complete the state machine. But all of that is hidden behind the DSL so that it's a lot easier to build um, than to make a series of calls on the, on the state machine builder. And the definition is then created when you call the complete method and that definition is then static. So it basically is not going to change and you can then use it to create an instance uh, using create, giving it a context and giving it an initial state or only the context and it may derive the state. So how does this all fit together? Well, let me show you. So um, here's some options for um, uh, uh, that I have. Um, examples and I want to build one of them and um, I've specifically taken the Kotlin for Android um, off the list. I am going to show you the ones that um, all of this code and all of this code is also available on the site uh, and repositories but um, what did the audience say? What are they um, interested in seeing Holger? Have we got so, any votes? Um, actually, it's your form, so I hope you see the the outcome. Oh of it. yes! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I uh, need what, to. What, would this be a uh, a good time to throw in some questions we got? Well, this the um, we if we've got questions, we can ask them right now. All right. Yes, so I will definitely... ask one, and and uh, Ivan will ask two. So it's just fair, I think. Uh, the one is from Jakob, and I don't even try to pronounce your last name, sorry. Uh, how do you preserve uh, atomicity between action and transition to next state? Um, atomicity. No, so this whole thing, um, I mean, it's a series of um, function calls and um, um, it will either pass or fail. And the transition, the change in transition happens um, right at the end. So after the um, uh, exit action is completed. And um, obviously if you are concerned um, about the, um, uh, the actions and the transitions, then you would wrap the whole thing in a transaction um, that manages your um, your state. So what I usually do is if um, I combine this with a, um, for example, an entity that represents the, the, the state, my context would wrap the entity and um, um, some service and expose um, specific actions. And then after the work has been done, then I persist the, uh, the entity and the whole thing then lives in one uh, um, transaction. Um, so let me quickly get to this form. Yep, um, uh, in the meantime, uh, Ivan, I think you do have two more questions. Yes. Um, so I have a question that I uh, share with Christoph. And we were wondering uh, where did info and lock came from? From the example uh, with the lock, unlocked state. At some point, there was like a um, if 10 else, and there was a locked. And actually, I was wondering, and then there was an, like an info object, and probably. We are missing a bit of context, or we, we didn't Ooh, get. The okay, file. let's let's just go back. Uh, sorry, this way. Was it here? I was a bit. Here you go. So, yeah, a lot. So yes. So so the info is the parameter that gets passed to the event. So in this case, my um, context is also sent in as the parameter. And um, so 
maybe what I should do is show you um, some of my examples uh, from the actual project. So, can you all see uh, my screen well enough? We can see it. If you could increase the yeah, so I just want to try and get to presentation. Really. Uh, it's uh, usually it's uh, F11, I think, is or it's uh, on the win a window should be Control Shift A presentation. There it is. Fire. What? Wrong one. Try this again. <laughs> yeah, that's life. No, it's all right. to be. Where are we? Appearance. There we are. It's way too easy. Now, now your now your screen is gone. Yes, now it's went it, it went somewhere else. Let me just find it. There we are. Okay, so here's a simple example where I have a, a turnstile class that is not immutable. So it's a normal mutable class, and it carries a boolean to indicate whether it's locked okay and it's my context and here's my states and then i have a state machine that is going to be created given a turnstile object as the context and i can actually um, uh, give it a saved state so it's um uh, one of these states, and if I don't, then it will use something from the definition. So, um, in this case, you can see it looks a bit different. It only has the turnstile class, which is the context, and it still has the states and the events. And it, when it calls this alarm action, uh, that action is expected to be on the turnstile because the actions body sees the um, uh, context as the, this. And um, the default actions, there's your default on entry and default on exit, and there's the default action. So any, any transition that doesn't find a home, it's the default action and it generates an alarm in this case. So um, this one would be more traditional in the sense that um, it's mutating the context and um, by sending it a lock or a unlock or return coin events. And as you can see, so the way the DSL works is you have this function that creates the boulder and then um, uh, the boulder can as the top level map with all the uh, with the default section, the initial state section, the default initial state. So um, it starts out locked, and um, but that's um, actually uh, redundant in the case where we have this initial state um, uh, defined because this expression will be evaluated if a state wasn't supplied. So in some cases, you will always be supplying the state, then you don't use this. In other cases, you say, no, um, I want to express that, uh, that's, uh, that logic for deriving the state, and I can do it in this initial state. So, um, as you can see, so in a companion object, I create the definition and it's the definition is then um, exists and it's internally, it's a, it's a series of, um, of maps and um, um, that points to all the relevant lambdas and stuff like that. Here I can ask the state machine for all the possible events given a state. 
and include default would basically allow me to include um, uh, um, any default actions that have been defined as well. So I usually leave that false, as you can see there, and it would give me back the list of possible events. So the definition answers that question. And up here is the actual piece that I'm interested in. So I've got a function called coin, which sends the coin event and a function called pass, which sends the pass event. And here allowed events will ask it for allowed and it maps them to text names as, a, as an example, or you could just um, return allowed and um, give it a, that set of, of, of states. So, um, and you can ask for the, the current state if you want to externalize it. So if you've created this afterwards, you can, when you've, you've done your work, you can ask for the external state and save it somewhere so that when um, you want to use it again, you can combine everything. So in a backend system um, where you, know, you can't, um, uh, store the state in memory, you will persist the state and you will only create the state machine when you need to use it um, uh, given a context and some saved state, etc. So that is a, a very basic traditional one. The other one I showed you is the one that um, uh, um, uh, looks weird because it accepts the context as a parameter and um, yeah, the, the, the context is immutable. So it was just a demonstration of how that can be achieved if you want to have a completely immutable um, uh, context. Um, yeah, here's an example of how it's, it's put together um, without um, uh, the definition. Now, this is, sorry. Yes, this was an example of what it would look like if you had to write all this code for managing the state yourself. And you can quickly see how all the maintenance about default exit and entry starts clouding um, everything and it becomes difficult to see what's really happening. And you can imagine if you have, this is just two states and two transitions. If you had um, uh, five events and uh, um, six or seven states, then um, this kind of thing would get ugly very quickly and very difficult to write. Um, whereas um, this DSL basically allows you to just focus on the things you want to add and everything you look at tells you clearly what it's about. So the votes came in and um, it's very close between Kotlin in the browser only and uh, Spring Boot with J, uh, Spring Boot with Web MVC, but at the moment, Kotlin in the browser is the winner, and just so that everybody can see, there we are. So uh, we had seven votes there, and we had six votes on that side. So it's literally one vote different. <laughs> Atios got one and um, Kotlin JS with JavaScript got one. But I'm going to show you some of the other code in any case. So what I'm going to do, do have, is, do, yes. Do we have, do, do we have uh, time for one more question? Because Christoph just throw one interesting in as well. Uh, sure. It is, why would I start a state machine with multiple start states like locked true false? Um, no, I don't start it with multiple states, but what I do prov provide is for a, um, a stack of states. So you can actually start it with multiple states that makes up a stack. And then um, um, 
the last one would be um, uh, the current state. And then when you do a pop, it goes back to the previous state. So if you then, if you've, if you've pushed states and you ask it for the current state, you actually get a list which represents that stack and you can externalize it and you can give it back later. So that is why I allow for multiple um, states in my, um, in my action, but um, it is uh, now to get out of presentation mode. Luckily, they brought that up as the first one. <laughs> okay, um, so I am going to open a little project that I put together, just the outline. So the votes was for seeing um, a project that has pure Kotlin in the browser. So I've got an empty little project here um, in my Gradle project. I'm using the Kotlin JS plugin and I've got my visualization plugin. I'm telling it it's Kotlin for the browser. I have um, my snapshot implementation, but I can use the latest one as well. I've added Kotlin coroutines and the standard libjs. I have defined the task to build a UMD module. And I have a copy task that uh, depends on browser webpack and copies all these artifacts into one place so that it can run and I can distribute that. And I have a task called generate FSM viz, which is the visualization, which uses this. So um, this is how I set up my visualization um, plugin. You give it the name of a, a, a state machine, where you want the code to go, which file contains the uh, state machine definition and where they want to generate plant to ML and where they want to generate the ASCII doc and uh, what do you want to call the output. So um, you'll see that a bit later. So in this project, I want to create a little state machine that runs in the browser and um, let's start from the browser's perspective. So I'm going to create an HTML file, um, index.html, and this will be my uh, turnstile demo. Right, here we are. And I want to, I've, um, just to make it look a bit nicer, um, I've included um, uh, bootstrap, otherwise it looks, um, oh, sorry. That way. And then I'm going to add some script for um, jQuery. Uh, actually, let's say that. And I'm going to add the script right for uh, bootstrap. And then I want uh, a little div. Let's look 
container um, and I want uh, I'm gonna create a, a row ah. and in here I'm gonna create a uh, that's a column that's not too wide and in here I'm gonna put my buttons okay so I have a coin button and uh, for bootstrap I need to add button and let's make it nice and big There we are. And I'm going to call it coin. Then I'm going to add a pause button. And I'm going to call that pause. So now I have two buttons. And what I want to do is I want to add some um, output in a row below this uh, class row and um, uh, div and, and this will tell me what the turn style state is so hey Uh, display four, nice and big. And I'm going to do a similar thing for the for a message so that the turnstile can tell us when there is a message to be displayed. And um, I'll get back to including the actual script in a little while. So now I want to create a, um, uh, my turn style. And I'm going to put that in a separate package. And I'm going to call it uh, turn style. Okay. So first of all, I want an interface. Uh, that represents my context. So it has a, a well locked boolean and it has a suspend function because this is um, um, living in the browser. Um, we do all of these as suspend functions. Uh, Lock. So that's the life of any UI coding is coroutines and suspend functions. Um, return coin and suspend function alarm. So these are the actions that you saw previously that we want to be able to invoke. I have an enum um, turn style event. And what do we want the coin and the boss? And I have an enum of states. And what do I want the locked and unlocked? Okay. So now I want to create uh, my turnstile FSM. And it is going to operate on a turnstile. I want to um, private the definition. So now I'm creating an async state machine. 
and I'm giving it my um, first thing is my uh, values dot set there we are and then my events values dot set and then my context. So now I know what I'm going to operate on. I'm going to say my initial state is if locked. Um, locked else unlocked. Let's just break it down so that it's a bit easier to read. I don't need a um, gradle on the side. So now we have our initial state. Now I want to say when uh, there's a default um, action. I want to alarm like that. And when my state is locked and I receive a, an event, and the event is a coin event, then I want to transition to um, unlocked install state.unlocked. And while I'm doing that, I'm doing um, invoking unlock. And if you remember, that was the only transition that we had in that case. So when I have um, unlocked state, I want to add a timeout so that I can go back to locked after three seconds. And I'm invoking the timeout function to do that. So um, this will allow, if you think about it, somebody puts in their money and um, or they, yeah, they put in a coin and after a certain amount of time, um, you want to do a timeout. But you also want to return the coin. So on event, if it's a pass event, when it's unlocked, then we go back to locked state. And we invoke the lock method in the action. And if there is an event with coin, we don't change state but we return the coin. So that is the definition of my um, state machine. But now I need to use it. So to use it, I actually declare an FSM, which will be created when this class is instantiated. And I say, ask the definition to create a state machine given the turn style. And I can now add a function, a suspend function, coin is fsm.send event, the coin event, and a suspend function pass. You can imagine that without um, 
asynchronous and coroutines and things, you won't be able to deal with timeouts. So I had to add that, and that meant that all functions needed to be um, suspend functions. And you will typically find that um, allowed uh, event equals fsm dot allowed dot contains event. So what I'm doing is I'm changing allowed so that it is a boolean. So I'm asking it, can I invoke this state? And um, you'll see how we handle that on the front end. So now I want to implement uh, something that can deal with uh, now you'll see there's some um, red line here. So this action actually expects parameters, but we're not using any. So I'm just doing um, uh, that for now. And um, unfortunately, uh, we can't ignore multiple parameters in a Lambda. So I'm going to create a separate in a separate package, I'm going to create a install handler. So this class is now the one that's going to um, live in the in the web world, okay? And it is going to extend uh, implement um, turnstile, which means that it implements um, all of these things. And um, uh, we'll get to all the details in a moment. So the important thing is that I need to talk to the web. So first of all, let me just get the, this thing is going to have an internal state machine. Uh, Turnstile FSM. And it is going to have a, a var boolean to represent this property. Okay. And I need to talk to those elements that I created. So I'm going to have a turnstile state. HTML span element, and I'm going to have a turn style message HTML span element, and I'm going to have a coin button that is an HTML button element. And I'm going to have a pause button. Uh, so I have a fun is to make my life a little easier. I'm saying if you want to find a span, a document dot get element. element by ID, given that ID, ooh, as HTML span element. So that little function I will, will help me to get to the span and here's one that will help me find the button. So um, element by ID, as HTML button element. Okay, so now I have an init function and the init function starts by saying locked is true. And 
it says the FSM is to install FSM with this because this implements turn style. Uh, the turn style state is a span named turn style state. The turn style message is a span named turn style message and the pause button is a button named pause button and the coin button is a button named coin button so now we are connected to the html objects and we can now say add an event listener when I click and in a global scope, I want to launch fsm.coin. Yes. And then on my pause button, I want to add an event listener on the click that in global scope will launch fsm.pass. So now I can send events to the state machine and I now um, need to look at what do all the pieces do? So in my, um, uh, my getter here, we'll just return locked uh, my timeout is going to have to update um, a message on the front end to say I'm timing out and it's going to um, want to update the view state. So I'm going to implement uh, those generic functions for updating the view state. So uh, that's another suspend function to update the view state. And I once again need to do this. All right, this here needs to be dispatchers.main. So now I want to get the text representation of um, the current state. So I ask the state machine, what is your current state? Now we can see that there is no method to do that. So let's go and add that. And this thing will say fsm dot current state. Uh, let's remove that. So now I say when it is locked, I want to return the text locked. And um, if it is unlocked, I want to return unlocked. So that's the text. And I'm now going to say turn style state dot text equals text. And now I want to determine whether I can turn the buttons on and off. Okay. So I'm going to uh, for each of the not fair, for each of the events no? so for each of the events I say uh, when event sorry. 
it is a false event. I'm now saying uh, false button dot disabled is if the FSM does not allow that event. And uh, the coin event, coin button dot disabled is not FSM dot allowed. Going. So now I'm, I've got a mechanism to update the uh, enable and disable the buttons uh, based on uh, the current state. And now I want a mechanism to update uh, the message. So I want another suspend function called update message. And it's just a piece of text. And we want to know if it is an error or not, because we want to make it red. So we say the color is, is error. Um, red, else, blue. And now we want to say turn style message dot style dot color equals color and uh, message dot style dot uh, equals if. Error. Okay, and then we want to update the text. Text. And um, now we want to say if the text It was passed in dot length so I want to add a little mechanism that will allow me to hide the text after a certain amount of time. So I'm going to say if it's an error, um, then I will wait for five seconds, else I will wait for two seconds. So I'll have a delay. And then I just say message.textcontext.equals equals empty string. So this will allow me to, to hide the message. So now what do I do? in my different events. So the timeout, all that happens when the timeout happens is I update the message to uh, timeout and I say it should be an error and I update the view state. When I go to uh, lock, what do I want to do? I want to change my um, unlocked variable to true. And I'm going to update any message to a blank. And I'm going to update the view state because I have changed the state. And for unlock, it's very similar. But I'm changing that to false. And then for return coin, I don't change any state, but I put in a message that says return coin. And that message is not an error. And I update the view state. 
So, oh yes. And when the timeouts happened, we are changing to unlocked. Ah, oh, back to locked. So, there is, oh, and alarm. Update message, alarm. And it is an error. And um, um, we can update the view state. And now I have an implementation, but in it's Kotlin. So even in the browser, we have a main function. We declare our handler and we say it's a turnstile handler. So now it is initialized and I'm just going to um, warm up everything by saying to the handler, update the view state. So when this thing starts, it should uh, run this, the handler activates binds to everything and then will respond to the events. Uh, that we've created. So now the question is, um, can we run this? Now, how does this work? In um, Kotlin JS, we'll uh, compile everything. It is busy installing stuff that it needs. So luckily you don't have to deal with NPM directly. And um, it's now launched it, but nothing's gonna happen. And that is because I haven't included the right script into my my page. Now, what is that script? So if I look in bold, I told it that I wanted, uh, where is this in here, to put all the assets into something called dist. So, Now I need to just raise my refresh. It's not allowing me to see this, why not? But in any case, um, in dust, it generates a JavaScript file that is named um, depending on how you've um, set up your project. So in my case, it will be named kfsm-web.js. So that's the name of the, of the script file uh, that would have been generated um, by Webpack in this process. And now you can see it woke up and it said, oh, I'm in locked state. And now if I click the coin button, it goes to unlock, but we said timeout. So it printed the timeout and it went back to lock. If I click coin and coin again, then it returns the coin. Okay. If I click pause, it goes back to lock. So there is our little um, state machine. And um, we got to write type safe code and it runs in the browser. And there's a few things you can do to, um, to clean it up, to strip out unwanted stuff. So there's um, lots of optimizations that keeps getting added to um, Kotlin JS to make this smaller. And um, I'm hoping that the JS community will grow and they will get more bindings uh, 
from for Kotlin and for other frameworks and things like that. So there we are. That is um, an example. And you can see you have um, interactions, you have timeouts. And um, um, I think the code is, is reasonably understandable. Um, there's an example. I'll show you some of the other examples. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to, yes. So let me show you uh, this one. So if you are using this thing on the back end, then um, I like the pattern called Hatios. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it stands for um, hypermedia as a representation of state. So the idea is that um, there's some conventions or standards that allows you to um, add metadata to your resources in the form of links and things that will allow you to um, tell the front end how to deal with it. So in the case of this, if I have a front end resource, it can get that information. For example, um, what's allowed. So I've built that into my um, resource assembler. So in the spring world, when we build a, 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 a resource, a resource wraps um, a class and we add links. And the resource assembler now says, well, how do I put this together? So I have something here that finds the possible events for an entity. So given its state, and for each of those events, it adds a um, link with the name of the event. So this is just um, uh, text um, name of the event, but the entity's ID is here. So what, ha what happens is in the, in the, when the application runs, and you get the resource, there's links that you can just follow to trigger that event. So the front end doesn't even have to figure out how to build up a um, URL to invoke something. It can just um, get the URL from the link with a specific name. And um, there's even a little uh, front end that goes along with this one that I did in um, um, with Angular. So if you give me another moment, I'm gonna fire that up and um, show you what that one looks like. So um, Okay, so in the case of this one, um, because I have a backend, it's just um, serving turnstiles, and um, I've made them persistent. So I have a little um, persistent context. Let's uh, go here. I can quickly show you what some of that looks like. So there's an entity. Um, where I store the state and the persistent context will use the repository uh, given an ID. Um, it'll get an entity and then it'll operate on that, um, on the context. So the context is this one. So lock will be called, it updates, um, 
the object and the controller is all that it does is it's basically um, returning all the turnstiles um, with their states when uh, you ask for them. So you can ask for a list, which is on the, on slash. You can create one by posting on slash. You can get one by asking for its ID and you can send an event uh, by using a post on the ID. And uh, let's see if my front end has fired up. Nope. So this front end is now a little angular front end and I can create many turn styles. And if I say there's money, then it unlocks this turn style. And if I say there's money, so this one doesn't have the timeout or anything. It just implements the state changes happens on the back end. It doesn't happen on the front end. And, um, but each of them are operating um, independently. And if you want to see, uh, let's just reload this and go here. So you can see what happened when it asked for. So that, that's two and yep. Yeah. So I have a mechanism that I usually use that on the route, you can ask for um, my API. So I, I have an object I return that has API version and it has basic links, that's the entry point. So this one says for create, you must do a post on that URL and for list, you must do a get on that URL. Now you'll see there was a, oh, that's a, there was a get and it came back with an embedded list of turnstile information and each of them had a set of links that told you whether uh, you could do a coin this one allowed coin and pass this one allows only coin so in the case of that front end it is using the presence of the link to determine whether it shows you uh, the state, but it doesn't know anything else. So all that the front end needs to know is events and um, uh, whether they are allowed. It might be interested in the state. In this case, I ask for it and represent it, but um, it may not. It might, might only be interested in, in states, uh, events, and in the parameters that goes into those events. And there's no logic on the front end that needs to know um, which, which events are allowed under which conditions, because I'm communicating that using Atios. And um, I'm using the state machine to tell me which events are allowed. So, um, that is a wrap. Is there any more questions? There's a website um, with a lot of um, information, there's samples, uh, there's some other links, and um, an older set of slides, which is basically the same as what I've showed you, is available on Speaker Deck. It sounds great. Uh, I will bugger you and ask you for the links again so I can put them into the video details as well. But we did have a, well, we have two questions. Let's start with Abhinandans. I hope I didn't do anything wrong in pronouncing it. Uh, is finite state machine similar to actor pattern? I am learning ACA now. And the concept seems similar, but implementation is a mm -hmm. bit complex with Acker and looks simpler in Kotlin. Well, um, 
I haven't used um, Accra in anger. Um, I've only um, played with it a bit. And um, I mean, the, the, the idea behind Accra is about um, sending events somewhere and something does work and um, uh, produces a, a result that you may be interested in or not. So um, its focus is on um, that event processing. Whereas um, the state machine is interested in managing um, uh, the state transitions. In other words, what's allowed. So um, you could actually put this thing inside of a um, ACRA implementation uh, to make the, uh, the decision about how to, how to deal with an event. And um, um, people actually use the string, the spring state machine like that. So they have um, message binders and events, and um, uh, there'll be an entity that, that uh, um, represents the, the, the state, the message identifies the entity in some way, and they'll instantiate it and, um, along with the state machine, and then do the processing. So this implementation, because it's um, not tied to anything, can be used in that in that exact same scenario. But I'm basically saying, I don't care where the event comes from. I'm only interested in once you give it to me. Whereas um, ACA is concerned with um, um, isolating the actors and um, um, adding plumbing to allow you to for events to um, um, be queued and managed and um, and things like that. Whereas that is not part of of, of my concern. So uh, the two can meet each other inside of the uh, the actor the actor implementation. Uh, it's much easier to talk if you unmute yourself. Uh, we do have we do have another. It's it's kind of a discussion point, not really a question. And mm -hmm. I try to get him onto the call so he can have it directly. But until then, I will relay the question or the point. And it's Christoph again, and he says he would prefer to have no parameters in the constructor so lock true false, but rather call dot lock after creation. Think also this creates a bit less code. He doesn't understand how you handle bigger state machines, or he can't really imagine how you would handle bigger state machines. It looks now like a huge hierarchical switch. Discuss. <laughs> uh, um, well, let me show you. Uh, More like fight. <laughs> uh, uh, um, your words, not mine, but yeah. So, um, Let's go back there. So um, I'm going to kill this guy and uh, let's find. So um, where is that guy? I mean, uh, no, that one is still very small. Where is my packet reader? Where is my packet reader? So the packet reader um, is not small. It has um, a few types of events, um, quite a few states. Um, I provided for um, this mechanism to identify what I call control characters. So at the top level, you give the packet reader a byte and it checks whether the uh, byte is an escape, it sends an escape event for all of those, it sends a control event. Uh, with a byte, and for all the others, it says it's a byte. So um, that would bring in my um, um, all my characters. Uh, 
from a serial line or whatever. And here is my um, implementation. So I have uh, a default event says no, send an act. Um, so whether it's a byte or control or escape state, um, I send the NAC and I go to end state. Then I have a start state and I have an event handler uh, for that because I expect when I'm in start state to get a control character and go to receive packet. And that control character will be a start of header. So that's my guard event. Um, here's uh, when I'm in receive packet state and I get a control. The control I'm, I'm interested in there is an escape. And um, no, start of start of field and um, or start of text. Um, normal bytes are just added um, uh, to the checksum. If I'm in the received data, I'm adding bytes to my um, to my data, and if I um, get the um, ETX, that means I'm at the end of a field, and then I end the field. And um, this type of thing will now build up a, a data structure with fields, and um, send a NAC, add a checksum. So they're very simple example here that doesn't do a complex checksum. It basically says now nah, the um, uh, um, here's an example of a stream. So I'm saying that the, the, the checksum will be the first character of the field. That's basically my rule for a valid message. So this message has start of header, start of text, these characters, end of text, that one is my checksum and then EOT. And I run through and I receive them and I print them and I check that it did send an ACK and that the checksum is valid. And then there's variations here that try different things to show that it fails. So you're welcome to try and write this thing. It might look like just a switch statement, but if you try and actually implement it with all the defaults and things like that, you can see that it gets messy very quickly, as I showed in this um, example over here, where um, handling for default exit and entry starts clouding what you want to do. And um, this list can get pretty long. So um, no, I think there's, um, State machines came about as a way to um, uh, to reason about this uh, uh, this problem. Very prevalent when it comes to protocols and things like that. Um, but I use it for um, business processes and um, um, things like that without having to implement uh, um, a BPM um, because. Um, um it doesn't necessarily warrant it so um i find this as a as a, as a as a nice mechanism for describing what i want to do and um um somebody else comes along and they can they can read this and they can from this imagine the diagram or with a visualization generate the diagram so this one there's packet reader. So there's the generated packet reader um, uh, state machine. And um, I actually love the, the visualizer. I mean, this is so nice. It's so easy to, to just give you a, a like a, a visual idea of what's going on. And yeah. even if I understand uh christoph question about you know looks like a switch statement eh, kind of because it it will be way more mm. verbose because if you want to be deterministic because you know you want to be exhaustive every possible combination and if you start using enum and when uh kotlin gets uh, verbose uh, mm. very quickly 
I mean, this actually looks like yeah, I, mean, I think you should, I, I it, want to try it, it, it takes, out because yeah, no, you're welcome. And I want you... to try it out because I yeah, because I'm using uh, this kind of approach on Android. You know, now the community yeah. is moving into this kind of uh, state management when it comes to the view. So now I'm here about Android. I can quickly show you what my Android example looks like. Um, uh, what, what, I, what I just think is maybe we should have a out of order session with you, Ivan, hopefully Christoph, <laughs> and I'm happy to moderate. And we just <laughs> and we just do it together on we air. We can just have a session and we talk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, no, <laughs> actually, we we do. We we do a couple of examples in uh, one in the as a state machine and one in a huge switch statement and just see mm -hmm. how far we get just to have this direct comparison. If you folks are up for it, I would be totally up for it. Yes. We only have so we just need a, a few days. Yes. To get familiar with the the library mm -hmm. because I'm now I'm genuinely curious because I was doing yeah. this mm -hmm. manually. And you know, if mm -hmm. I start use, I was using uh, Sim class instead of Enum, so kind of mm -hmm. the same thing. Uh, and when you start doing the exhaustive when, you know, the, the whole thing just explodes because you have states and then you have events mm -hmm. and then you have to start, you know, multiplying uh, times. Exactly, events that's time. the thing. Is it, it multiplies very really quickly? Crazy. Yes, it, it, it gets. I mean, you you can kind of work it out. Yeah. but it's a lot of code and you know it's not yeah. easy to and that's that's the whole idea is that um uh, the, the, it has your back so it's going to fall down and it's going um, to tell you when you've missed something in a, in a in a clear and concise way um i have an android example that um uh, is um, similar to what I showed you on the browser in terms of how it works. So that one also um, will go to unlock the little timeout or um, return the coin or um, Yeah, Holger, we we definitely need to do the the conversation because now I'm I'm yes. hooked. I'm totally hooked. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Andrew, I mean, then I need to try it out. Well, yeah, you got so, it. Yeah, you can, you can... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you show me a toy that is super <laughs> super interesting. I need to try. I just need a few days. Just give me a, give me a moment. I, You're I welcome. Walk through. But this is actually this is this is nice. I like it. Yeah. Now you can find me on the um, Kotlin Lang Slack. Um, uh, send messages, ask questions, um, uh, log a bug on the um, on the GitHub, um, and um, yeah, join the conversation. Um, I find there's room for this, and um, I have a project with many small little state machines everywhere that um, do their piece of work, and. Um, um, they're easy enough to uh, to implement, and I find that I uh, I get value out of, of, of using this mechanism because um, um, I recognize very quickly. Okay, this is now where it it it's more than just a uh, a when. Um, if it becomes four wins and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 cool. So exactly. I, I, I try, I try to get Christoph to join us. Uh, let's let's stay in touch and but give yeah, yes. Ivan a bit time to to sort himself. <laughs> thank you, thank, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming. And Gopal, do you have any last words to add? I think Gopal is asleep. I don't think. Well, it's it's, it's no, a rather late for him. Night. Yes, so it's I'm really sorry that I've kept him up so late if he's still up. Um, Opa, if you're still with us, say maybe something. Maybe he wakes up tomorrow morning and he has <laughs> these interesting ideas that floating around his mind yeah. and he doesn't know where they come from. 
Well, we can we, um, we can we can then tell him. Yes, and um, <laughs> we can have this at a at a at a, at a earlier slot that suits him. And um, he's he's maybe. rather far ahead, but yeah, let's see. We ha I, I have to come up with something to to say thank you to him. Right. Okay. So no worries. Uh, thank you so much for being on. It was really interesting, and you even you got enjoyed. hooked for thank you for another session. Christoph just said he will contact me, so fingers crossed. Uh, stay tuned, everyone. Thanks for watching. I hope uh, you enjoyed it as well. And we see everybody. Us... Stay safe. Yes. Just stay healthy. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye. Bye, bye.